Hi, I'm Andrew Cordes, and today I am joined with Dr. James White. Dr. James White is the director of Alpha and Omega Ministries, an apologetics ministry based in Phoenix, Arizona. He is the author of 24 books, and he has participated in 173 moderated debates. Dr. White, thank you for joining me today. Good to be with you. To begin with, I would like you to share with us the origins of Alpha and Omega Ministries and where it is today. Well, it obviously didn't start in Australia because no one in Australia can say Alpha. Um, but <laughs> we've been around for quite a while. Um, we started in 1983 and a small group. All we wanted to do at the time was witness to, uh, to Mormons. Um, I had met two more missionaries, Elders Reed and Reese, a few years earlier, right after I had gotten married. And uh, we had started uh, teaching some classes at a very large church that I was a member at. And so it was my wife and I and uh, another, another man and his wife, uh, there, that was all there was. We had one badly photocopied tract that, in hindsight, I'm not even sure that that tract was fully orthodox. Uh, but um, we, had, we had one tract and a few books uh, that we had purchased, and that, that, that was the entirety of Alpha and Omega Ministries. And really, for the first, uh, first 10 years, it was really, it was tough. It was very difficult. Um, we started going up to Salt Lake City, witnessing to Mormons up there at the General Conference and out in uh, Mesa, Arizona, where they uh, had a large temple. The Mormon Church used to focus upon building large temples. Um, they've changed that. Now they build smaller temples and they're more spread out and things like that. But back then, temples were a big thing and uh, they'd have pageants with you know, 150,000 people would attend over the pageant. And, and uh, so we started gaining experience uh, in that way, started doing radio. Unfortunately, there's no archives of those from back in the 80s. Our archives only go back in the 90s, but uh, we've been doing the dividing line uh, for, for many, many years. And uh, then we expanded into Jehovah's Witnesses. People started asking questions. And uh, of course, I was getting my, my education at that point in time. We went to seminary, somehow survived that, and still, still wanted to witness to, uh, uh, to people. And uh, so it's just grown over the years. The, the, the ministry itself hasn't grown physically all that much. Um, I'm not smart enough to, to handle a staff. And uh, uh, we, we really are just focused on doing the work, uh, not so much having a staff to raise funds and stuff like that. So we've always been, we would say, lean and mean, um, not buildings and things like that. So we're, we're more focused on getting out there and doing the stuff and doing the teaching and things like that. But it's not a, it's not a normal, it's not your normal apologetics ministry. We cover so many different topics and do it in a, in a different way than, uh, than a lot of folks do. That's uh, sort of unique and uh, obviously some people seem to enjoy it, especially when we do special things like something called Radio Free Geneva and stuff like that. So it gets people all excited when we talk about certain subjects. The task of apologetics is clearly significant. Could you maybe give us a basic understanding of the task of apologetics? Well, uh, apologetics is the task of the church, actually. Uh, we don't pretend to be a church. We never try to take the place of being the church. Sometimes people try to turn us into a church, and we're just not interested in that. Um, uh, we're always uh, part of a local church and, and um, trying to be an assistance to the church. But, uh, the elders of the church are supposed to be able to refute those who contradict. The elders are supposed to be able to exhort in sound doctrine. And, and um, all Christians are, are meant to give, be able to give a reasoned defense to those that ask them a reason for the hope that's within them. So that's supposed to be something that we're all prepared to do. But that's, in 1 Peter 3, that's actually derived from the fact that when we treat Christ as Lord in our hearts, it's gonna result in a change in our priorities and, and people are going to ask us, where'd you get this hope that other people don't have? Um, so the going out and doing the debates, that's more looking back on Paul and the apostles and how they, um, how they pursued evangelism and interacting with, uh, with the world around them and dealing with the various religions that uh, they would encounter in the various cities that they would go to, the, the paganism, the, the philosophers. Uh, uh, that's really where you, where you drive the, the biblical basis for that, kind of, for that kind of thing. But obviously in our day, uh, we 
I couldn't have seen this coming when we started Alpha and Omega Ministries, but one well, of the main reasons we, we've been able to do what we've been able to do is because of the rise of electronic media. Um, you know, in 1983, I don't think Al Gore had invented the internet yet. So uh, uh, how, could we, how could we know that there was going to be an opportunity to utilize um, mechanisms that would allow us to communicate all across the world? Um, that's a, that's a, a situation we couldn't see coming, and we've just sort of adapted uh, and to be honest with you, we were one of the first uh, webcasters um, back even before there was MP3 technology. It was uh, something called Real, Real Audio, if anybody was old enough to remember that. And uh, this is back in the days of AOL and stuff like that. But um, uh, that, uh, we, we were forced into that because we couldn't afford to pay the radio bills for a regular radio program. And all of our calls were coming from, from people listening on the internet anyways. And so I was like, why are we paying a, a radio station? So we started doing our own and, and uh, someone helped us to learn how to post it and stuff like that. And that sort of blazed the trail um, because we couldn't afford anything else. That's great. You mentioned at the start there that apologetics is the task of the church. Right. Could you speak into how pastors and elders can, in an effective way, equip the church for the task of apologetics, but maybe even speak into how church members themselves can be greater equipped? Well, pastors and elders often find themselves having to uh, sort of get some training because it's generally not a part of most theological educations. Um, certainly not in my day. I mean, there was a, I, they did have a class on apologetics, but it was just sort of a, an elective over on the side. It wasn't uh, part and parcel of everything. And today, given the situations we face in, in our culture, now it's absolutely necessary, but it's still not necessarily a part of, of the training. So the pastors and elders uh, need to get up to speed on it. Um, I had a church history professor who, uh, who said very clearly, uh, it's amazing the things you remember from long, long ago. You can't remember what you went to the grocery store to buy, but you can remember what a professor said uh, 35 years ago in school. Um, he said, uh, that which is a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pew. And so if there is a lack of clarity in the thinking of the leadership, there will be a, a muddle in the, in the minds of those uh, in the church itself. So. Uh, I think the best way, I mean, obviously you can have people in, you can have seminars, things like that. How many people really remember all of that, you know, only a few months later? There has to be a regular modeling uh, in the ministry of the Word. And so in our day, it would be, let's say you're, you're walking through 1 Corinthians, uh, there would be numerous places where you could make a direct application to cultural situations that we face today uh, without being overly artificial about it. You, know, you don't have to sneak it into every single sermon, but uh, if you can help to equip the people um, in the regular ministry of the Word by giving examples uh, from the pulpit and, and then applying those examples in real life as well, uh, that's, that's probably the most effective way. And, and then being ready to give resources to, to to know how to direct your people to some of the best materials that are available out there because we've, we've never lived in a day when, when information was more quickly available to people. I mean, you can almost buy almost any book on, on a device almost instantly and be reading it in a matter of minutes. It's um, Erasmus and Gutenberg could never have thought of the situation we face today. At the same time, that also means there's a lot of garbage out there. Uh, there's, no, there's no vetting anymore as to what ends up being put in print. And so uh, there can be a lot of confusion. I've often described a Christian bookstore as the most spiritually dangerous place for a Christian because uh, you know, they can buy commentaries on Scripture, and yet that commentary is written from a very unbelieving perspective. It can be very confusing to a believer to read that kind of thing. Thank you. For those who've watched or even listened to your debates, uh, we know that there's a range of topics will be raised. But it's just interesting to note that there are some topics that seem to come up nearly all the time. And what I have in mind there is things relating to the triune God, uh, Christology, and also the history of the Bible. Why do you think those things come up 
And then maybe could you speak into why should we as Christians spend time really having a grip on those matters? Yeah, obviously, I, I think the most foundational of those, um, if you're defending an Orthodox Christian position, um, the foundation of your beliefs is going to be the first thing that is attacked. So why do you believe the Bible's Word of God? What about changes? What about textual variants? What about the canon? Um, different translations? What about other, other world scriptures? And um, part of that is just simply obvious. I mean, if, if you're debating religion, it has its own scripture. They're going to be challenging your reliance upon your scriptures or a limited canon that instead of having their expanded canon, you know, the Mormons have the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Program Christ, things like that. Um, but it's also useful for them for the simple reason that most Christians don't get a lot of education about where the Bible came from. Uh, we're converted, we're given the text, everybody around us is simply reading it and believing it, um, so we sort of imbibe it, but eventually everybody starts to have questions about well, why is it only this size and how do we know that this is what was originally written? Everybody starts having those questions. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of sermons and even outside of the ministry of the word in the service, in Bible studies, whatever else the church may offer, how often do you have studies on the canon? Uh, I remember uh, when I was uh, in high school, my dad was a member of the same church I was a member of, and I remember he, uh, he offered, because he was a graduate of Moody Bible Institute, he offered to do a class on uh, something like, you know, the background of the Bible and, you know, how we got the Bible and stuff like that. And I remember once getting out of youth choir to just go visit his class just to encourage him. And he was, and this is a huge church, 20,000 members. And he, there he was in the room all alone. No, no one had... There's so much more interesting classes to attend. I remember it just broke my heart. Um, and uh, so even when you have people who make that kind of information available, a lot of folks choose to go for the, I mean, why not go to a prophecy class, you know, find out what's going to happen in the future. It's much more intriguing to people. And so even when we offer the information, hopefully in our day, now that people are getting challenged over and over and over again, I'm surprised at how many people, when I do... Dividing Lines, our, our webcast on canon issues and uh, textual transmission issues and stuff like that. They love it, but that's probably because they've already found us because they want that kind of information, because they're already dealing with those kind of challenges, maybe have family members that are raising those kinds of issues all the time. And so, yeah, but I think more and more Christians are starting to fall into that, into that category and, and recognize that. Um, so... Yeah, there's, there's, uh, as, as the, the pressure increases for us to give an answer, and as we live in an ever less, or shall we put it, post-Christian Western society, uh, then there's going to be more and more desire for that kind of information. Thank you. To those who listen to The Dividing Line, there are many things you will repeat often, but one of those things are the words, theology matters. In fact, about 12 years ago, that had such an effect on me, I got that printed on a cap. Really? And I was walking around with it and I was on the coast one time, it was real windy, blew my cap off and I don't have it anymore. I hope it fell into the hands of someone yes. who needed it. Yes. Um, but can you tell us why does theology matter? Well, you know, I'm not the only one that has said that, but I, uh, I, I have pretended to copyright it. But, uh, you know, that, that comes out of uh, very often when you are addressing various objections. Um, what the Christian faith teaches is going to determine and limit the range of your responses. And so it, it's very frustrating when you uh, encounter Christians who develop their apologetics, they develop their arguments based upon what they find that works. Uh, and then they sort of play with the theology so that it fits what their answers are. They're going the wrong direction. Your theology is what determines the answers you're going to give. If we really believe that God has spoken, then what he has said is going to determine um, what we can and cannot say faithfully. Over the years, I've learned that in apologetics, there are certain arguments that are developed against certain groups that may be effective, but they're not overly honest and they're not overly truthful. 
and there's there's almost a pragmatism that, that that comes up and you have to be thinking long term if if let's say i'm let's say i'm successful in getting this person to start questioning their their perspective and things like that if i eventually get them into a solid church are they eventually going to recognize that I wasn't being consistent in the methodology I used to bring them out. I wasn't giving them truthful answers. I and mean, what, what kind of an impact could that have negatively upon someone down the road? I, I, I can't do that. And so theology matters is just simply a statement that we have a divine revelation. We don't get to edit it. We don't get to change it. We don't get to improve it from our perspective. If we think we could improve it, then why are you following it anyways? But um, we have to allow that divine revelation to be what determines the parameters of our responses. And that, that means that there are times when I can't join the, the current popular way of addressing a particular subject or something along those lines. Uh, and certainly having a very specific theology, as I do, being a, a Reformed theologian, is going to limit me even more uh, because I have to be consistent to a more specific body of theology. A lot of apologists tend to be very vanilla when it comes to their, their theology and not want to get tied down again so that they can utilize a particular methodology uh, that they find effective. Um, from my perspective, you're effective if you glorify God, you're effective if you're consistent in what you're saying. I don't, I don't have the same standards a lot of people have in judging what e effectiveness actually looks like. I appreciate that, and I must say you are very consistent in that, so thank you. Uh, I'm very curious, you have participated in 173 moderated debates. How do you prepare for a debate? Well, you, you raise kids in their teens. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's the best way to get ready for anything, I guess. Um, no, I, I've often said that um, uh, being able to engage in debate is a it, it's a unique skill set and not everybody has it and not everybody should do it there are scholars so far beyond me in their in their intellect and the depth of their study that should never debate um, I remember meeting with this one scholar once a brilliant scholar on uh, on the Reformation period and especially on Erasmus but every time you would ask him a question he would just literally sit there for a minimum of 30 seconds very carefully formulating, drawing from his vast knowledge. That doesn't work in a debate. And it, it doesn't work in video, it doesn't work in audio. Uh, dead air on the radio is not a good thing at all. And so there are just certain people uh, that do not multitask. You have to be able to multitask. You have to be able to listen to what someone's saying, take notes, prioritize, get your own information out. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in a, in a debate uh, to be able to do it well. And um, so uh, preparation, it, it sort of depends on who I'm debating. I mean, years ago in doing some of my major, major, major debates, you know, I could spend six months preparing for, for a debate. So when I, when I knew I was going to be debating Bart Ehrman, oh, wow, uh, you know, just listening to hours and hours and hours of his lectures and, and things like that. But especially today, there are times I only have a matter of weeks uh, before a before a debate, and so you've got to be drawing on your whole life's work in that in that situation. Um, when you're debating someone who has extremely unique position, I, I debated Dr. James Price, who um, is a mythicist. He doesn't believe Jesus actually existed, and his perspective on that is extremely unique and unusual. Um, that took a long time to be listening and looking up references and stuff like that. Um, so it really depends on who you're debating. If you're, if you're debating um, a Muslim on Trinity and Tawheed and it's your 14th time doing that debate, hopefully you don't have to spend a huge amount of time uh, because you've already been doing that preparation for, for a very, very long time. Um, but the other thing is you, you need to make sure that what you're, what you're presenting, you got to know what audience uh, you're really you're really aiming at and these days thankfully because of the internet and things like that you can broaden out the uh, the audience that you're you're intending to communicate to um, and uh, 
even if you're doing the same subject, you can approach from a different perspective to try to reach another element of the audience that you may not have in a, in a previous debate. Um, so you, you keep all that in mind, uh, what your opponent's going to allow to happen. Uh, are they, are they going to be a good opponent? Are they going to be an opponent that's trying to use cheap debating tricks? There's all sorts of stuff that goes into the calculations of exactly what level you should seek to approach the subject on and things like that. Thank you for that insight. In addition to your debates, you've authored over 20 books. And I think of some of the titles, The Potter's Freedom, The Same-Sex Controversy, The King James Controversy, uh, The Roman Catholic Controversy, and of course there are many more. But there's a little book in there that might be a little bit surprising to some people. Uh, and that is a book on grieving, The Pathway to Peace. Would you better tell us where did that book come from and maybe speak on a pastoral level as to what you're getting at in that book? Yeah, um, most people don't know uh, the book. Uh, when, I, when I first wrote it, uh, <laughs> my editor uh, loved it, but he, when, before he took it into the publishing house for the internal review, uh, he said, I'm going to take your name off of it. Uh, and he, he did that because of the books you just listed, uh, this controversy, that controversy. He felt that it would uh, unduly prejudice in a negative way uh, the review of the book. And so when he, he did that, they read it, they loved it, they said they wanted it. And then he told them who wrote it, and they're like, oh, no, because <laughs> how are we going to market this? This guy doesn't have a heart. He's an apologist. So it, it came out of, um, you know, as I said, the ministry has not always been as uh, well known as it is now, and hence as well funded as it is now. And so there was a period of time where we lost a major portion of our funding in one day and i had a small family i was making nothing to begin with and and i had to find another job and uh, i was told about this position as a staff chaplain that was at a, at a major hospital and i had never done anything like that but i had a master's degree in theology from a well-known seminary therefore uh, when I applied, I got the position, and it was it was some of the hardest work I ever ever did. It's extremely hard to just walk into someone's sick room and and um, and start up conversations. For me, I'm a Scotsman. That's that's not what Scotsmen do. Uh, but one of the things I had to do was a lost support group. Every uh, it worked out being almost every Sunday. It wasn't supposed to be, but due to circumstances, that was a crash course. Uh, I had never taken anything in seminary even to even begin to prepare me for something like that. And it was not a Christian uh, hospital. Uh, therefore, you had a lot of unbelievers and you had a lot of widows who had just lost a husband of 50 some odd years and had no earthly idea what they were supposed to do in the rest of their life and, and things like that. And, and of course, you had experience in the hospital as well with death, uh, some life-changing uh, experiences I had with sudden deaths, uh, six, year, six month olds and and going into the cancer wing and it, that kind of stuff really really changes you so when an acquaintance of mine um, his 29 day old granddaughter um, died well was suffocated when her mother had an epileptic seizure um, attended the, the funeral and and uh, i was no longer a chaplain at that point i had uh, i had been able to finish that work and was back to alpha mega full time but uh, I just felt like I needed to share everything with him that I had learned over those years. And so I just pushed everything off the desk. It's not a long book. Uh, people in grief don't want to read a 300 page tome. Uh, they need something. It's very practical. People, when people read it, they're going, really? It, it's just super, super practical. Little things like how to handle the holidays and things like little things we, we normally don't think about um, that I had learned over those years in doing that, that lost support work. I'm very thankful to say that uh, they were distributing that book by the, the caseload to the first responders uh, at Ground Zero on September 13th, 2001 in New York uh, during the attacks in, in, in the United States. Um, so it has had an incredible life unto itself. Uh, a lot of lost support groups use it. Um, and it's, it surprises a lot of folks that, that came from that guy. Um, but that was the unusual circumstances that brought it into existence. And so once in a while I'm asked to speak on that subject. It's the hardest subject I, that I'm asked to speak on. Because as a chaplain, I never developed the rhinoceros hide uh, that 
most chaplains, I think, have to develop, um, you know, the ability not to cry uh, and things like that. I never developed uh, those, those skills. And so even just talking about it is, is, is difficult for me. But the fact of the matter is the church is... The church stinks at preparing people for death. We're, we're just like the culture around us. We, we don't talk about it. We don't prepare our people for it. Um, I used to give a talk called Christians Grieve Too um, because there are actually Christians who think that grieving is sinful, that you're not, it's, and it's like, no, you need to understand if you're old enough to love, you're old enough to grieve. And um, uh, you have to keep that in mind. And grieving is a long process. And we treat it like it's something you're over, you're over in two weeks. No, you're not even over the shock in two weeks. Uh, that's when the shock's just starting to wear off. And the, the real depth of a, of a deep relationship loss is four to, four to eight months later. And we expect everybody just to be over it and fine by then. Well, that's not how it works. And uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the most unusual book in my in my list, there's no two ways about it. Thank you for sharing that. And personally, I am greatly blessed by it and I know it's meant a lot to people who are very close to me. So thank you for uh, what you've written on that topic. Uh, Dr. White, the last question I wanna ask you is in relation to preaching. Uh, we know the apostle Paul had commanded Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 to, to preach the word, to be instant in season and out of season. You wrote a great book called Pulpit Crimes. And I wonder if you could maybe speak to a generation of preachers who are preparing for ministry, perhaps are in their early years of ministry, could you just share a few words encouraging them to take that task with great faithfulness and accuracy? Yeah. You know, I, I very honestly um, do not view myself as much of a, uh, a, much of a preacher. I consider myself much more of a, of a teacher and an apologist, first and foremost. And so when it comes to the dynamics of preaching, um, I don't necessarily suggest that people imitate me at all. Uh, I have an unusual style. Um, I'm much more comfortable uh, addressing uh, issues in the context of a sermon that most people shouldn't even try to try to address. Um, and so I, I recognize that reality inside. So I don't make the claim to be, uh, you know, the great example in those things. But I do preach and. I preach regularly. I'm a pastor in a church. I have I've been in eldership for a number of decades, and so uh, I think that has very, very important to my apologetic work. Uh, I see far too many apologists that are just completely disconnected from the church, and as a result, I think that greatly hinders and damages their uh, apologetic work, and frequently allows them to start losing balance and, and things like that. But Obviously, uh, you know, I consider it the highest calling uh, to be called into the, the ministry of the Word in a regular sense amongst God's people. It's a, uh, it's, it's a calling that we don't honor uh, the way that it should be honored. We ask many of our ministers to, to do things we shouldn't be asking them to do, uh, that that's not a part of the gifting, and it's distracting to them, very often discouraging to them. Um, but, you know, a person has to, I really think if you're going to last in the ministry, it's because you, you recognize um, that you're, you've been called to serve someone other uh, than yourself. Uh, you've been called to a very high calling. You've been called to uh, bless the people of God, but also to be prepared that if you're going to try to do that, you're going to be hurt by the people of God, too. You have to have a, a recognition that when you see the big names up there, most of them have gone through many, many years of struggle to get to where they are. And you may never get the opportunity of having you know, the big large church, large church and the large ministry or whatever else it might be. And there are difficulties that come with those, too, and responsibilities that come with those. You may not want it. You may think you do, but you may not want uh, all those, those difficulties as well. But you want to be able to look back uh, once you get to your older years and uh, say, I've been, I've been faithful and consistent all the way through. I didn't, I didn't chase after all of the worldly systems of success and things like that. Uh, I just look at... Uh, I want to finish well, and, and I, I look at some people and I see them just 
desperately trying to hold on to some type of kingdom that they've built and the result is destructive for themselves and everybody around them. And oh, I don't want that. Um, you, need to, you need to be a good exegete. You need to be a person who can handle the Word of God well. And if you consistently seek to do that, there are going to be difficulties, there are going to be trials, there are going to be things completely outside of your control that you will be blamed for. Um, and whenever anybody leaves your church, they'll never tell you the actual reason why they're leaving. They'll tell everybody else, they won't tell you. That's just every person who's an elder uh, realizes that when you meet with someone who's leaving, you're going to be told story X, everybody else in the congregation gets story Y. That's just, that's just how it works. Um, but um, be prepared for that kind of stuff. And if you're, if you're in it for the wrong reason, that will drive you out. Uh, there are so many uh, former ministers in IT uh, and computers and other things today. And part of the reason was not that they didn't have the capacity to do the work. It was having the heart to um, be able to survive the... Uh, the challenges and the difficulties and the, uh, the constant need to be repairing the wounds in your back uh, because that will happen and you just need to be aware of it. You're, you're ministering to a bunch of sinners as a sinner. Uh, it would be nice if it wasn't that way, but you know, you read Paul and you read all the struggles and the pressures he was under and we all sit around going, man, I wish it was like in the apostolic age. No, no you don't. Uh, you're not reading the New Testament if things like the apostolic age. Corinth had problems, and unfortunately, the Corinthian church has uh, been multiplied many times today. So uh, be, be, um, be aware of what's, uh, what's coming your direction. Be faithful. Be a good, good, good handler of the Word of God, and uh, trust the Lord with the results. Dr. White, I am most grateful to the Lord for your faithful and fruitful ministry. And I want to thank you for being a willing messenger. You have blessed the church around the world, but particularly, I want to thank you for the way you have ministered to the church in Australia. Uh, we are very grateful that you've come. You've been here before, but now that you've come again, thank you for your contribution and thank you very much for your time in this interview. Thank you very much.